Hello, my name is Claudia Sotomayor. I am the Chief of the Ethics Consultation Service of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. I am thrilled to be here with you sharing some thoughts on um, Hospital Ethics Committee and Clinical Ethics Consultation. I have no conflict of interest. And let me allow to start with a brief historical background, um, basically to respond to the question, when did the idea of having a mechanism to solve ethical dilemmas began in the USA? And I think we can trace it back to the 1960s when the admissions and policies committees of the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center at the Swedish hospital was created. Um, so this committee later became known as the GOT Committee. Um, and it was formed, I think in 1961 to choose which patients would receive the newly designed hemodialysis machine. Now this committee was highly controversial because this group of people had no moral or ethical guidelines. Um, it was a group of lay people chosen um, randomly and they develop inclusion criteria based on age, sex, marital status, number of dependents, income, net worth. Um, even they thought it was a good idea to think about future potential. So as you can see, these criteria weren't necessarily what we call we would have, we would call today ethical. These would not be considered valid nowadays for sure. After this event, we had a series of cases and events that triggered a lot of conversation, debates, dilemmas. Uh, for example, in 1968, the Har Harvard uh, released the brain death criteria. In 1973, Roe versus Wade. Then in 1976, Qu the Quinlan case. Louis Brown, the first IVF baby, was born in 1978. Um, then we have the baby doe regulations in 1984, then in 1990, the Cruz and case. So as you can imagine, with the development of new technology and the rise of cases like the ones I mentioned before, bioethics was born and it started to grow. Pellegrino was one of the main founders of clinical bioethics and he was interested in incorporating this set of um, moral views of virtues within the medical practice so we can become, become better doctors and better practitioners. Um, in 1982, only 1% of hospitals in the United States had a hospital ethics committee. But by the year of 1988, the number had increased to 67%. And then in 1992, the Joint Commission of, Accredited, um, of Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations released a mandate that required that all American hospitals have to have a mechanism for hospital personnel to deal with ethical issues, um, especially related to inpatient care. Now this um, request is very broad as they just state a mechanism. They don't really mention what kind of mechanism, but as long as a hospital has a mechanism, they can be accredited. Um, by the year 2000, it was established that over 95% of community hospitals had established a clinical ethics committee. Now, you may be thinking, what is a, a hospital Ethics committee. Then, so we can define it uh, defined it as an independent organism of an institution that is formed by clinicians and other professionals, and its function is to defend the security, the integrity, the dignity, and the rights of our patients and our clinicians. Um, the hospital ethics committee has three main functions: education consultation, and policy review. Currently, efforts are being made to improve the functions of the hospital ethics committee. 
especially the consultation services. Um, and it's growing in a way that is incorporating also organizational ethics. Hospital ethics committee's characteristics are well studied. Most of the scholars agree that committees have to be competent, impartial, independent, and multidisciplinary. The, these characteristics are well accepted globally, and it means that the committee is formed by physicians, nurses, lawyers, social workers, lay members of the community, philosophers, you name it. Um, and although, again, it's globally accepted, this multidisciplinary approach has been the subject of discussion and a lot of debates. Because for some, um, this multidisciplinary approach is not enough to reach optimal resolutions to the presented dilemmas. Um, even though, you know, having professional diversity helps the committee to see dilemmas from different angles and keep themselves aware of new developments in other fields, there is no evidence that this approach helps resolve dilemmas other than by utilizing consensus, which is not necessarily the best way to solve ethical dilemmas. Some authors argue that the ethics committee should be constituted by experts in the matter, meaning clinical ethicists who have the appropriate skills to address ethical dilemmas. From these three functions of the ethics committee, I will focus on the ethics consultation role, and I will explore the value of having a bioethicist or a clinical ethicist on, on, on staff. First, let me start by saying that some studies have shown that improving ethics consultation services can have a positive impact on healthcare organizations. Um, there is evidence that ethics consultations decrease the length of, of stay and costs, and that by increasing ethics consultation volume, there is an improvement in the perception of the quality of care by physicians and our nurses. Unfortunately, the consultation services aren't used as frequently. Um, the national average in the United States is three to eight consults per year, which is pretty low. And it varies a lot. Um, some hospitals that I know have a, around 400 consults per year. But when you're balancing and comparing with hospitals around the, the country, it, you, you could see a lot of variety. Um, some surveys show that the medical providers are uncomfortable with these committees. Some think that the ethics consultants are not well prepared or are not helpful at all. Um, I have uh, experienced or heard in, in, in some occasions, people or physicians referring to the ethics consultant as not helpful at all. At all. Um, the other reason that these um, services are not explored or utilized um, is because some people fear that if they call for an ethics consult, there will be having an increased um, possibility of a lawsuit, which is absolutely the opposite. I think um, having an ethics consultation on chart, if your case goes to a lawsuit, having an ethics consultation can actually be helping your case. Um, and then the, the last reason why the people are not consulting the ethicist is because they don't know they can. Um, it's very simple. They don't know that their institution has an ethics committee with an active ethics consultation service. So to summarize, we have people not calling a consult due to fear, to distrust, or to the lack of knowledge of the existence of the service. And this is a little bit of a spoiler alert. A study showed that it is 
45 times more probable to know of the existence of the hospital ethics committee when there is a bioethicist on staff. And we're gonna talk about that later. Um, now, with what I've said, I, it seems to me that, that we have a problem, right? On the one hand, I described that there is this evidence that ethics consultation improves some aspects of hospital life, right? It, it decreases the costs, the length of stay. So ethics consultation and the presence of the ethicist seems to be very positive um, for the patient, for the physicians, and for the hospital. So we can say we, there is a need of, to use this. There is an important contribution that needs to be explored and ex exploited. But on the other hand, we have a lack of usage with only a three to eight consults per year. So there is this disconnect. Um, what I'm proposing here is that to close the gap between the need for active ethics consultation services and the usage from, of them, we have to have bioethicists on staff. A bioethicist must lead the ethics consultation service because this person can serve as a liaison between the committee, the clinician, the families, the, the patients, and even it can help with organizational ethics. Um, the rationale is very simple. When you have someone who is trained, who has the expertise, they will be actively participating in the aspects of this, um, of what they are supposed to be doing, right? They're creating awareness, they're available, they know what they're doing. On that note, and before we move forward with this idea, I think it is fair to say, or to make a parenthesis and to clarify what do I mean when I say a bioethicist. A bioethicist, for me, is someone who has the expertise in the academic field of bioethics, and that can be demonstrated in different ways. It can be someone with a relevant advanced degree in bioethics that is specialized in research ethics, or is someone with an advanced degree in bioethics who's doing more the philosophical aspects of bioethics or biopolitics or environmental justice. Bioethics is a great field with multiple specializations. Within this field, we have the clinical ethicists who are bioethicists who are trained and specialized in dealing with ethical dilemmas within the um, clinical world. The role of the clinical ethicist is to aid in some way to guide the other person's actions, meaning the patient, the physician, the nurse, the staff. And, and they do it not because we are better persons, but because we are trained to do so. The clinical ethicist um, has a very unique role within the hospital. And I think it's very important to be distinguished from other roles. I think um, sometimes there is an obvious overlap with the, uh, between these other roles, um, the social worker, the chaplaincy, sometimes we work together um, and we can be dealing with the same problem, but from a different angle. And it's important to say that we are not social workers, we are not patient advocates, we are not chaplains, and we're definitely not the ethics police. It is not the role of the clinical ethicist to convey tickets when people are not being ethical, right? And I think that is a false perception um, that's going around. People think that if they call ethics, they're gonna be judged in their moral, being or someone is going to be, you know, targeted or classified as someone 
bad as you're doing, you're, you're a bad person. And that is definitely not what the clinical ethicists do. Um, on the contrary, we are summoned to assist when specific ethical concerns and questions arise. When, when we are called, the first step is to help the parties understand what the ethical problem is. What is the ethical question? Um, once we figure out what the ethical question is, we try to facilitate communication among parties. We have to make sure that everyone's values and ideas and principles are heard. And we create this uh, safe space of dialogue where parties evaluate moral reasons for different alternatives. And then we facilitate re the resolution of the concept. The role of the clinical ethicist leading the ethics consultation service is varied. Um, we do rounds. Uh, we, and, I, and I'm a strong proponent of rounds. I, I fully endorse them. Um, so when we're rounding, we're going in different units. And it's very valuable because when rounding, we're creating visibility. We are making ourselves available for the staff members. We are creating trust. We're building trust among the teams. And we get to be involved, involved in the day-to-day -day life of, of the units. And that way we can also uh, engage in cases early on. Sometimes we can do some preventive ethics as well. Um, another thing that we do is that we create databases to keep track of our consults. And this is a very, very helpful tool because we can assess, for example, you know, if we are getting more consults from neurosurgery, then we know that maybe we need to be more present in that unit. Or if we notice that one request is more distressed, first we know that we need to tackle that problem in different ways, maybe pro providing the resources for our faculty or staff members, nurses, physicians to have the resources to solve this moral distress issue. And we can also provide with education when needed. We can also be part of debriefing sessions when needed. Um, a few weeks ago, our team was part of a wonderful debriefing session between the nursing team and some physicians. And that created a very nice and powerful way to express ourselves and to go through the different um, things that happen in cases through the ethical and moral lens. We are also part of different committees. Uh, for example, I'm part of the palliative care committee at our hospital, not besides the hospital of the committee, of course. And again, this is very important because we are creating these relationship in this um, team, um, team-based work. And of course, one central role is the ethics consultation. There are different ways to do ethics consultation. Some people use a team model where two or three ethicists participate in one ethics consultation. Um, some other hospitals use the whole hospital ethics committee model where the whole ethics committee addresses every case. And some hospitals, especially those with a clinical ethicist and staff, utilize the individual consulta consultation model. We, um, here at the PCCB, we use a single ethicist consultation model. And so how it works is one consultant carries a pager and is available 24-7. The rest of the team is always available to assist. Um, and, th and this is separate from the rounding and all the day-to-day -day work we do. Um, so even though we're rounding and we're present at the hospital in a day-to-day -day basis, uh, only one ethicist carries a pager and is available 24-7. Now, when we receive a consult, this is basically what happens. Um, so we get paged 
we use a Pellegrino ethics workup, which basically, you know, help us analyze how we are going to do our, our methodology that we're going to use for, for the case. Um, and then, so we start by defining the ethical question. We do an, an initial assessment to discern if the consult has married or not. Um, that is not to say, you know, oh, no, this is not an ethical issue. We're not going to take on your call. But we help them define what the ethical question is. And if there is not an ethical issue, we can simply say, hey, look, this is probably not an ethical issue. This is probably something that you could solve by calling social work. Or how about if we talk to chaplaincy or, or, or patient advocacy, depending on the, on, the, on the call. But once we define the ethical issue, and if it is an ethical issue, then we go ahead and gather the facts by reviewing the patient's medical record and speaking with the key stakeholders, patients, family, physicians, nurses, social workers, whomever is participating in the case and is relevant for the ethical issue at hand. If we think it's appropriate, we participate in care conferences where we facilitate the conversation listen to all the parties involved. And that help, that is very helpful because we can formulate then our ethical arguments and we can evaluate if the preferable, preferable options can be implemented. And after that, we offer our recommendations. Now for the future, um, there are some um, things happening in clinical ethics that is exciting for me. Um, the first thing that is happening is that there is an attempt to professionalize it. Um, the recognition of bioethics as a profession has been a topic of, deba of debate for some years now. Um, the reason it is debatable is because some people think it's a stretch. Some people think that um, having bioethics as a profession is not necessarily the way to go because bioethics would lose the freedom the, that they have currently. And it also is difficult to create a, a sense of um, coercion given all the different moralities and all the different schools of, school of thoughts that are available. The ASBH created also a certification that aims to evaluate the knowledge and skills for clinical ethics consultation. Um, this certification has been criticized because the requirements to present it are considered too low. They ask for a minimum of a bachelor's degree and 400 hours um, of healthcare ethics experience. Now, this is, this is creating a lot of debate because you can see that it's created for ethics consultants, but not necessarily for clinical ethicists. And let me explain. A healthcare ethics consultant is not necessarily by ethicist. An ethics consultant is someone who happens to do ethics consultation, whereas a clinical ethicist is someone who has an advanced degree and specific training in clinical ethics. In the United States, 34% of the individuals who perform ethics consultations have medical degrees. The rest have various degrees in fields of nursing, social work, theology, and only 5% of those providing ethics consultations have completed bioethics, um, a bioethics degree or a fellowship. So the healthcare ethics consultant can be a member of the ethics committee who examines and resolves ethical dilemmas that arise in a particular case. Um, so the remaining questions regarding the accreditation or the, cre the credential, the certification, is um, should clinical ethicists take the certification when it's not necessarily designed for them? It seems to me that the certification is mostly done for healthcare ethics consultants but not necessarily for clinical ethicists. 
And last but not least, there is a movement of having a more integrated ethics. More and more, we see that the clinical ethicists are integrating themselves into a hospital life and creating a team-based approach. Um, this has been possible by creative and innovative approaches where clinical ethicists are, as I told you, rounding in units and becoming part of the team and are participating in irregular meetings. Um, even the, the VA has developed this integrated ethics program where the goal is to support, maintain, and improve ethics quality in healthcare by creating visibility and building trust and helping in the practice of preventing ethics, but in a way that it encompasses all the dimensions of ethics within the institution, from organizational ethics to the bedside. The only thing to be aware with this approach is that the ethicist must remain impartial and uh, it, it has to be very aware that we have to be there for a patient and for the clinicians. So we really need to man maintain our neut neutrality at some point. Overall, I think clinical ethics is growing and it has a lot of potential in helping our institution, our peers, and more importantly, our patients. As Dr. Pellegrino would say, ethics consultation has to be pa patient-centered and always aim for the ultimate good of the patient. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I look forward to your questions.